Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dave Vellante with John Furrier. This is our day four of our AWS reInvent 2024 coverage here from Las Vegas. We're upstairs, we go wall to wall. It's been unbelievable. Andy Warf Warfield is here. He's the distinguished engineer at Amazon Web Services. Good to see you again. Thanks for coming on. Good to see you guys. Thank you. Uh, so, wow, I was saying, we were talking uh, off camera, and I, I counted like 30 you know, updates in the storage world. I mean, so <laughs> many updates in, in S3. Amazing. Uh, I sat through an hour-long you know, presentation, rapid fire. I'm like, when do we get to ask questions? And, you know, there was like five minutes left for Q&A. And so I'm so psyched to have you here so we can dig in a little bit. But my question is of those, I don't know if it's 30, but it's close. What's your favorite? Oh, geez. Um, it's probably the S3 table stuff. That's been the- Very cool. The, the big- So explain that. Let's dig into that okay. because that is such a hot topic. Open table formats are all the rage. You know, the, the last couple of years, we've seen the market move to them. But so explain- S3 tables. Sure. Um, uh, Parquet data, which is used to store tabular data, has um, been one of the highest growth types of data on S3. It's become the, for years, the standard, kind of the right, de facto. Right. right. Um, we do 15 million requests a minute to Parquet data. Um, we serve 150 petabytes of Parquet a day. So there's like a lot of analytics happening to Parquet. Uh, about three years ago, we started to hear customers talking a lot about OTFs, and in particular, Apache Iceberg. And uh, that's ramped up. And the thing that we found with Iceberg and the customer conversations is on day one, it's pretty easy to turn on in Spark, pretty easy using tools. Um, but as you get experience using it, it kind of gets a little bit more burdensome to run. And so we were having a lot of customers ask us to make it easier to run Iceberg on top. Yeah, so let me OTF, open table formats, and customers, what's the motivation? They don't want to be locked into any environment. They want to have be able to bring any engine and be right. open any, right. any they want to bring any compute to any data. Exactly. Uh, okay, we've separated compute from data. Great. That was the, the cloud. You guys actually, you know, made that happen with some of your partners. But now it's opening up even further, opening the aperture, right? And then of course the big question is how do we govern all that stuff? I right. know that's not necessarily your swim lane, but that's an important consideration for customers, yep. right? And yep. part of that is metadata. Mm -hmm. which you guys are also have made some announcements around. Yes, totally. Um, on the table stuff, yeah. but on the iceberg side, the distinction between traditional parquet and the OTFs is that it takes what was basically read-only tables, right? You could add to them by adding whole parquet files and makes them mutable, right? Brings them closer to being a more conventional SQL table. Um, that is becoming a primitive in S3, right? So you'll be able to create a table bucket, we call it, create a table inside it. It gets its own... Endpoint, it's a first class resource, which means you can set policy, access control policy on the whole table, which was difficult to do before. Um, you get, because we know that it's tabular data, we get a huge performance bump because we can customize storage and namespace performance to it. Um, and it integrates with everything. Um, the metadata side takes that table and turns it into a system table that we manage. And now as you put data into S3, just as a normal S3 customer, you could turn on metadata and we will fill a table effectively like CDC, the changes, change data control, the changes in your yeah. bucket and populate a journal of all of the changes you've made to the, to the bucket in a table. And so now you can bring SQL tools and go and analyze sure. and look at all of your data. And what we see with a lot of the S3 workflows, Gen AI, of course, but also things like genomics and health data is customers are augmenting and extending the data they have in S3. And so having the SQL surface means that they can go and like add their own fields, build their own metadata, curate, tag, all the data that they have in it. So going back to what you were saying about making the, the, the table mutable. Yeah. So that means a third party client can, will be able to read and write. Yes. To those tables. Yes, absolutely. So in a true open format. Okay. So, and so today with the S3 table launch, um, an Iceberg client talking directly to the table can read and write today. So you can turn on um, Firehose, uh, Amazon Data Firehose added support for Iceberg. You can take any Firehose source and pump them into um, Iceberg tables in S3 tables. And then you can take QuickSight, which has also added Iceberg support. You can like stand up a dashboard and start pulling that stuff out. Give a scope the value there because some people might not understand what that means. The Firehose connects into the S3 table bucket quick site pulse on just I mean, take us through what it used to be be like it was it was a fair bit of work to go through this stuff and then what how many steps did it take i mean and now what is the outcome now so old way you had to cobble some stuff together it didn't read it didn't write, read but no rights and now you got both and now you got fire hoses what does that mean like all 
I, I time to value. I, I, it's a hundred percent time to value, right? And I, I don't think we're all the way there, right? There's still a whole bunch of stuff for us to work through, mm -hmm. but relative to working with objects and setting your own schema and kind of like working with the object data, it's still a valuable pattern. But now with iceberg as a kind of like common ground for it, you're dealing with like rows and columns is an abstraction that you work through. You can have something like Firehose putting stuff into the table. You can have other clients putting stuff into the same table because iceberg mediates that. And then you can attach whatever you want to pull stuff out. It's a fusion of just the yeah. integration yeah. is seamless. And it's been super exciting to see the reaction to it this week. People yeah. are like, yeah, I had it. Pretty excited about people it. People who know this. Oh, really, bet. It's nerdy. It's like, yeah. It is total. It's like, I get it. Like, yeah. people who know storage. Well, and the team, all week, you know, the team's been absolutely, like, killing themselves to get this thing together. Like, they've been so invested in it. And launching something where you get this kind of reaction, the team is just... Well, congratulations to the team, you guys. It's We've been covering on the Snowflake, Databricks, the whole data warehouse. Mm -hmm. As it goes next level, uh, we've been following a lot of the the challenges and opportunities around what this could cut, turn into for the developers too. And also now you got the citizen developer now online with the, the tools like Q for business, Q for developer, right? It's only going to get easier yep. to write apps. Absolutely. Well, even QuickSight this week announced support for Q-based natural language queries to yeah. build the, the dashboards themselves. So you can sit there in Q and just describe the dashboard that you want and start bringing up stuff. Give me sales for the month. Yeah, amazing. Over time, five years. Yeah. Like, listen, it's amazing when you think about S3. I mean, the original, the OG of, of the cloud, <laughs> what, 2006? 2006. Okay. And it was like, oh, wow, object in the cloud. Get put. Simple. Cheap, deep. Okay, great. But, and now it's evolved yep. into, and you've got now high performance object, you got, which I think you announced last year at, at reInvent. How should we think about the portfolio of services within S3? So I, when I was putting together the storage talk for this year, I was reading the 2006 PR, right? The, the AWS PR. And there's this S3, it talks about S3, and it says S3 is storage for the internet. And it's just this one sentence in the thing. And that is today, still, 18 years later, how the team thinks about it, right? Like, we've always said we will go where the internet takes us in terms of storage. And so you see stuff like, you know, table buckets, but all of the things along the way that have, that have come in there. So where is the internet taking us now? Because obviously we can see the agentic wave, data, having that data layer, completely agile, but also extendable. Yep. And integration, hassle-free, zero ETLs now. No one even talks about that anymore. It's like, hey, it's happening. Oh, I'll tell you one thing that I think has been a really interesting change, and it's kind of motivated the tables and the metadata launches this year, are for, I don't know, 10 years, my storage conversations have often been about storage. Right, their conversations about performance and scale and cost. Cost. Yes. <laughs> um, over the past few years, a lot of those conversations have shifted to like us seeing customers build data lakes yeah. and inside organizations pull data from different bits of the organization and build new stuff. So it's a data and conversation. It's a data conversation, and the data conversation most recently has shifted to there's so much data, and it's never like, oh no, there's like it's never a negative. It's a, like, how do I get to value fast on top of all that? How do I do discovery and how do I do understanding? So it's data so, and value. So we're getting pulled versus. into like assembling value on top of the, the data. Yeah, and the thing about metadata that uh, my land was chatting about when she was leaving the queue, it wasn't on camera, I wish it was, but you know, by all the reasoning, auto reasoning's coming out, all reasoning engines are coming, obviously reasoning's a big part of the AI wave. But having that metadata yep. is only gonna extend better reasoning. Absolutely. And to explain why that's so important, having the more metadata around everything. On the training and inference side, um, the quality and the selection of data that we're seeing from folks is like, it's in every conversation. So they wanna be able to tag the difference between generated uh, versus source data. They wanna be able to differentiate and build like highly diverse sets of source data and not keep retraining on the same thing or biased selections. And so having a metadata layer that lets you like curate, but make the curation sticky Right, and being able to then go and select with a query mm -hmm. is like a really valuable thing for those yeah, folks. Yeah, it's funny how S3 is becoming quite a developer um, go-to. It's almost like the, I hate to use the word bare metal, but I mean, it's as low level primitive. It is. Um, John, there's a, there's a thing in here that I think you guys will get a kick out of because <laughs> you guys are a little bit OG on the <laughs> stuff too. The, the table stuff has this like more subtle thing that I think is cool. Um, 
all of the coverage I've seen this week is analytics, right? Iceberg, yeah. everybody understands that surface. There's loads to talk about in there, but that is one section of the S3 customer base. And what I'm hearing in a lot of conversations is like our builders are excited about using tables for application data, right? For like other types of data. And you know, for you guys, like you guys are seeing applications built with like yeah. SQLite or Postgres yeah, to yeah, back sure. it for years, just like yeah, hidden yeah, in the yeah, back yeah, of whatever yeah. application. And I think there's a neat thing that's about to happen where Iceberg actually ends up being that embedded database in some senses, right? Like it's yeah. it's the back end that applications write to, except all of a sudden now you can bring any analytics tool yeah. to bear on your application data. It's, 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 it's a pinnacle, bridge. It's the pinnacle of all other yeah. things so because it can integrate with other tables. Like, think, think about integration think, layer. Just think about the data warehouses in general and even the cloud data warehouse. It was in BI. It was, it was created because it was just so difficult to, you know, the storage was just dumb storage. And now it's not anymore. Yeah. It's like it's got all these capabilities and it's dramatically simpler because yep. you've got object and it's it's highly performant now. If, if, and, and you have choices there. If you want to spend a little bit more, Absolutely. you can you can drive that. Um, and so the possibilities are quite interesting. Um, what about block? What can you tell us about? You know, can you give us the update? On the block side, um, was that not your swim lane, or I haven't been working as much with the EBS folks uh, this year. Um, yeah, I, there's a there's a ton of movement onto IO2. Uh, the performance yes. there continues to be spectacular and, and get better. Um, it's I, I I don't have a I don't have a soundbite on. Yeah, no, it's all good. It's, it's like, you know, when I see what you guys did with the the new Aurora distributed SQL, I was right. like, wow, that's you know. There hasn't been, I don't think there's been a, 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 a meaningful announcement in distributed SQL in years, other than, you know, Oracle has some stuff, but actually not, they don't do distributed, but then I think, okay, there's gotta be some storage behind Well, that. Jazzy mentioned the serverless aspect of Aurora too, with DSQL, you got the DSQL and you got the right. serverless yeah. side of it. Yep. He was touting that piece. And it's gotta be high performance storage underneath. And so, but anyway, I mean, S S3 is just continues to rock it, you know, we love it, obviously, <laughs> our data lake. Uh, I heard, I heard, I heard the other. Please now it's, it's three table buckets. I'm like, table bucket? Yeah, well, oh, and then like, like whoa, managed God. iceberg tables and S3, oh, holy cow. The, 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 pause it, we riffed on this. A lot. Yeah, this is like right. one of our hottest podcast topics. Really? Yeah, because the whole, the David and the team been digging in hard on something you can read to, not write. There's like all these like machinations of things around yeah. The different people trying to form it. Not really a first party citizen. Now it is. And then, yeah. uh, now it's yep. all of a sudden, boom. Yeah. yeah. That's it's a game changer. And totally. I mean, and, and you know, I, uh, this this is the first reinvent I've heard that's had, I won't say reconstruction of, of AWS, but I'll just say kind of like a, a reconfiguration of some of the things. New core building block with inference, more discussion of primitives. We've talked more about blast radius on the cube here than ever. I don't think we've ever t used the term blast radius. It was an Amazon term um, because you got infrastructure advancements. You got it's an old S storage term. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you talk to James, big old disk drive, when remember? You, when you talk to James, oh yeah, they blow up too. <laughs> <laughs> and the consequences of disruption again, disruption kills innovation, right? So when you're at scale, yep, like, you know, if you're going to be storage for the internet. Did you guys see uh, the coverage in Dave's talk about some of the nitro-based? Yes, oh yeah, absolutely. The ultra oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So link, separating, link. separating the separation stuff. Yeah. That's storage. that's been a project that we've been working on for yeah. a few years internally, and it is. Well, so let's let's, cool. let's talk about that a little for bit. Sure. He had he spent a lot of time on. Is this yeah. Neuralink or is it for ultra? Service? No, no, yeah. this is for storage. For, oh, okay. For, for, as he he he, I spent, he gave a master class on uh, his hard disk drives uh, and yeah. blast radius and separating basically the controller and compute function from the backend JBOD, right? And so, but give us a little- Sure, tutorial. sure. So, I mean, um, on the hard drive side, right, the drives get bigger and bigger. The performance stays the same, which means the performance actually gets worse per byte, right? You guys know. Yeah, I mean, how long does it take to recover from these, you know, huge drives, right? And for us, for, for the S3 team in particular, we're always trying to adopt the biggest drive. So we always want to drive costs down. We always want to get the most bytes per like square foot of floor space because the amount of data we store is increasing. We got to be efficient there. Um, for years, the way that we drove that was two things, adopting bigger drives and packing more drives into a rack. And the way that we would pack more drives into a rack was to build JBODs with more and more drives behind a host. And what was that big 
Barge. Barge, yeah. So they, they literally had, they showed a picture of it. It was just a so they, they, they've talked about like kind of our <laughs> biggest design, which was two hundred and eighty eight hard drives behind one server. Oh boy. And Talk about blast radius. That thing had some <laughs> blast radius. Yeah, yeah right? I'll stand too close. To <laughs> if I don't lay the match. If, if we did that, if we did that thing today with twenty terabyte drives on it, it would be six petabytes of storage on a single host. We we didn't do that. We yeah, backed right. away from the barge and like at that scale, we were finding we were like actually hyper optimized on compute and memory on the server for the number of drives we had, and so we took a dis like decision about like four years ago to start exploring another way of doing it and doing this disaggregation thing. And so we stuck Nitro in the hard drive rack and Nitro's job for the hard drives is the same as it is for the compute. Nitro is virtualizing the drives and it's doing basically nothing else. So it's just in there to put the drive on the EVS connection on SRD into the instance. And now the S3 team is free to use any compute, any I can scale it independently. Right? Yeah. If you lose the host, you just remap the drives to another host. So the availability is right. better. Right, the flexibility for developers is better. We can actually change instances as the workload on the drives change. So, like when we first bring a drive online and we're filling it, we're driving a ton of work to it. We can use a beefier instance, and then we can scale down as yeah, yeah. the thing comes into suite. Okay, elasticity is amazing. It's a how are I mean, I haven't followed it for years. How are the hard drive manufacturers achieving these densities? Are they not? They can't stack more platters in there, right? They do. They, just, they do actually. That's what they're doing. Jam, how so, many platters in a disk drive? I, I, I think <laughs> the most recent might be uh, eleven. Is it really? Oh you know? my God! No, they're not spinning them faster, right? The, the, no, the, the the rotational speed's been about the same. Yeah. But uh, they've moved into energy assist. So like hammer drives yeah. have been coming out, and uh, you guys could go do a deep dive on that. That would like fascinate everyone because those drives have a laser that heats up the surface of the drive to make it more receptive to like small magnetic changes, right? The, the fly height, the head to the surface of the drive is one nanometer on a modern drive. One nanometer. 10 really? carbon atoms in that space. That's insane. <laughs> wow. It's crazy. It's... And, and they work, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and so that's, that's been able to, so that's actually something, one of the few things, John, we got wrong. <laughs> because we, we saw the you know, price of flash coming down and said, okay, that's going to kill high speed, high spin speed disk, which it right. did, but it but the price of the hard disk assist they've done a remarkable well, uh, job. The, yeah, they, there's they, basically they, two manufacturers they left. Stayed ahead of it. Like, yeah. Absolutely. So there's another fact in this that you guys will love, which was that we were looking at um, we're looking at like the potential in S3, right? Like the value of S3 when you build a storage system for anything, you're always provisioning for the peak, right? Like you're. You're always provisioning for your need. Right. And so when you're building a single tenant enterprise system, you have to anticipate like the busiest hour of the day. But then all the other hours have that like valley of unused stuff. Right. And so the S3 value obviously is that with loads of tenants, we stack all those bursts up and the system is more utilized. Sure. Right. Right. And so we looked at like what is the value to the highest bursting customers on S3. And the thing we found as we dug into it, we asked which buckets had data on the most drives, and we found that we have over 10,000 customers, over 10,000 buckets, that have their data spread over a million physical hard drives. Man. So like, like there's a million disks wow. with, <laughs> with, with the customer's data. It's just, imagine building that system for yourself. It's, it's an uh, Okay, and so what you have to think about how to recover from, you know, failures, right? Because the- MPTS We're constantly recovering from- Because, they, I mean, the, the the I don't know what the MTBF is on a disk drive these days, but you know, whatever it is, however many drives you have, you're going to guaranteed be a, a, a failure. Right? That's right. There's failures. The drives right. fail all the time. continuously. It's yeah. at the yeah. population. Even though they're you know super reliable. That's right. It's just the yeah. it's just the math. And so we're just constantly like like dealing with that. It's, it's part of the system. Yeah, Andy. One of the things we've been hearing this week. I want to get your thoughts on this as you guys yeah. think about the future is that Amazon's reached this point of scale where it's kind of rarefied air in the sense that you see things at scale, and mention some of the things about the drives and the failures, the blast radius. What, what are you seeing as opportunities that the S3 team can do that's not possible by just anyone else just starting from ground zero or time zero as you start to see these innovations and a lot more things going on, the integration of graphs. What, what kind of things are emerging to the team in terms of, wow, we can do that. That's something that was on the radar. That's now part of where your view is. You're seeing things. I, so, like, to pick one, right, on the, on the hardware side that we're talking about, 
there's a great talk. You guys should watch the recording from earlier in the week. Seth Markle and James Bornholt, who are P's and S3, gave this talk about S3 gory internals, right? Like, like, <laughs> I, like I was jealous as heck about that. <laughs> uh, total mechanics. Uh, under the total hood. mechanics. Yeah. But one of the things they called out is the team has 18 years of experience operating a massive hard drive fleet. And one thing that we've like really started to get good at is, you know, we, we basically hedge against that continuous rate of drive failure by like having redundancy, spotting the failures and rebuilding way ahead of it. We maintain a huge buffer, right? It's kind of what's behind the 11.9 stuff. And in recent years, what we've realized is we can use that exact mechanism to move faster, right? Because if we want to bring in new software or we want to bring in new drives, we can actually like pad out that redundancy and take a small population of production hosts, deploy a new thing and run straight into production with it without exposing anyone to heightened risk, right? And so like the scale that we operate at actually means that we can move faster in a storage system that historically like you would perceive as being like a battleship of like slowness and so speed. So like so one our speed. scale is driving velocity on stuff. And, it, and, and it's astounding seeing Nitro do just that one function. Yep. We always, we called it years ago, we called it AWS's secret weapon. <laughs> you know, and it's so and true. It totally is. You know? Yeah. Amazing. You know? That's awesome. All right, hey, thanks for coming on theCUBE and uh, give us a little uh, inside baseball on this. We really appreciate it, Andy. Andy, Thank thanks. Thank All you. right, John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We'll be right back right after this short break. We're here at reInvent 2024 in Las Vegas. You're watching theCUBE.